Welcome to the Radiant Visalia podcast. Join us at one of our two services, 9 a.m. and 1045 a.m. Download the Church Center app or visit our website, radiantvisalia.com, to stay connected with us. All right, enjoy. First John 1, verses 1 through 4. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest and we have seen it and testify it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father, and was made manifest to us, that which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Thank you. You may please be seated. Thanks, Ernie. As I teach uh, for the next uh, 30 minutes or so, we are interested in taking your questions. So last week we started a next day Q&A where we sit down and wrestle through the questions that came in during uh, the preach. And so please, there were some incredible questions that came in. It was so exciting last week. So if anything comes to mind or you've got a burning question, uh, please... Uh, send it in. Uh, Some of the questions had to do with our text. Um, Some of the questions had to do with my friends messing uh, with me. Uh, Both both are welcome. The question uh, that came in that I would, that was the question, uh, came from Micah Stipik. Listen to this, listen to this question he launches in. Micah, are you 18? This is an 18 year old. On the topic of guarding our lives and hearts against false doctrine, how do we have the unity commanded in the Bible with someone who is a well-meaning false teacher? If someone is unwilling to change and causing destruction to the church, when is it, out ti- when is it time to outright reject a well-meaning person? Come on. The future is bright. I mean, that's a, that's a deep question. I mean, we're wrestling through that, not just here at the church, but with employees, maybe in friendships. Like, when, when is it time to cut ties? Maybe some of you are wrestling through that with a, a spouse or a family member. That is a, that is a deep question. So, $20 to component coffee, you win, Micah. Come on. This is like, if you're a gap year student, this is like a quarter of a million dollars. Hey, I have a question for you before you send a question to me. The question is, have you ever been a part of a handoff or a transition? Maybe in your company, maybe in a school, maybe in a church. But have you ever been a part of kind of a much-loved leader handing off the company or the campus or the program? Have you ever experienced that? I think you know then how much hangs in the balance and how people are holding their breath going, what's going to happen when our pastor of 40 years hands off to the new guy? I bet he'll change the screen placement. You know, that kind of like, oh, So much is at stake when our beloved kind of institutions or programs or or even families are are handed off when a transition takes place. My senior year of high school, um, Mr. Depker had been the principal at Golden West for decades, and we loved him. 
And the poor guy who followed him, I mean, he, right from the get, we were like, we hate you, you know? And it wasn't anything he did. I'm sure he was a great guy. He just wasn't Mr. Depker. And it's like, be gone, you know? So much hangs in the balance when there's this kind of a handoff. Everyone is nervous about the transition. What will happen to our city? What will happen to our community? What will happen to our company when someone else takes a place of leadership? What Ernie just read was written by Jesus' last living disciple. And there's so much at stake in this transition. And I think that's why John begins without a beginning. He doesn't even bother to introduce himself. He wants to get down to business. There's a baton being passed here. And that's clearly what he's interested in. And that's clearly what he's doing in this text. Text. Most people believe that this letter would have been written around AD 85, 50 years or so after the death and resurrection of Jesus. So the church is 50 and one generation is handing it off to the next. This letter was written by John, although if you read the whole letter, it reads more like a sermon. It's not linear like a letter. It is circular like a sermon. It keeps coming back to themes as he drives his point home. This letter was written and meant to be read aloud like a sermon in a region of house churches in modern day Turkey. So John oversaw these churches for decades. They would have known his voice. They would have known uh, you know, what was interesting and of value to him. And so this was to be read. And the reason he's writing, he makes it really explicit. And he says in verse two, chapter two, verse 26, he says, I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. So there's these churches that John loves and cares for are going through a transition and they're facing threats, not physical threats yet. Physical threats and danger will come. John's combating ideas that threaten the strength and health of the church. He's actually interested not in physical things, but there's these ideas that are distorting. People that he loves are being deceived. People that he loves are then denying the faith. People that he loves are now departing from the church. Can anyone relate? Anybody lose a friend off the left side of the boat? I did. Anybody lose a friend off the right side of the boat? Me too. They're being deceived. They're denying the faith. They're departing from the church. The particular trouble seems to be around what we celebrate at Christmas. The incarnation, the coming of Christ in the flesh, the idea of the God-man was under attack. And uh, throughout church history, it's always been under attack. The idea that Jesus was fully God, fully man, was fully under attack. We do know that. The strange ideas about the incarnation were the result of something deeper, a deeper set of beliefs called Gnosticism, and we touched on it last week. But Gnosticism's a little bit hard to pin down because it combined a bunch of aspects of different religions. So it was kind of like a build your own religion. Sound familiar? It's very fluid, part pagan, part Persian, part Judaism, part Christian, part Greek philosophy, and it's fluid. But the big idea, if you can just remember one thing, when I say Gnosticism, you should think the body is bad and think matter doesn't matter. The spiritual was superior, the material was inferior, and we needed to flee. Mark Sayers, in a book that I would recommend to you called Disappearing Church, I really would recommend this. I, I feel tempted to quote so much from this, but he has an entire chapter on Gnosticism. 
But the book's really about going from cultural relevance to gospel resilience, and I, I think you would benefit from the book. But he says that there's basic beliefs of Gnosticism. One is the world of time, space, and matter in which we live is inferior. Two, the world is inferior because it has been created by an inferior and possibly evil God. Beyond our world and the inferior God, there is a sublime place to which we must progress. Number four, we can progress to the sublime place when we discover the divine spark within ourselves. Number five, truth is found in the individual. We must look inside to find our true self. Number six, we can, under our own steam, progress to the sublime place through knowledge in the Greek gnosis. We escape the inferior world by finding hidden pieces of knowledge in the world and in ourselves. It gave rise to uh, a couple things. One would be the religion of all hail me, a gospel of self. Self is the new God. So Gnosticism moved authority from the seat of God to the seat of the human soul. God did not descend to earth to give us the gift of salvation. Instead, the individual soul filled with potential and power ascends to the heights of perfection and powered by the divine spark. You only need to self-actualize. Also, it gave rise to this idea of an inferior world and an inferior God. This botched world in which we live is the creation of actually a very limited God, and we've progressed beyond Him. He should have done better anyways. If God is so good, if He's all-knowing, if He's all-loving, if He's all-powerful, then how do you explain this? If I was all-knowing, if I was all-powerful, if I was all-loving, I could produce something then better, better than what we see. So the world is not the work of a good God that's been messed up by human hands. The world is the work of an imperfect God and needs to be reshaped by human hands, discovering the divine spark. So no, a fat no to a life of faith and obedience to that all-knowing, all-loving, all-powerful God, and a yes, a fat yes to a life of breaking boundaries, rejecting definitions, transgressing the limits. The great quest of life is to discover who we really are. That's when we go, oh man, I think the Bible has something to say to us today. <laughs> <laughs> to be clear, what's being described here by Mark Sayers wouldn't fully take shape until the second century, but these ideas would have given birth to the challenges going on with the incarnation of Christ. God did not come as a man because material is evil. He did not come in the flesh. He didn't suffer for sure on the in the flesh. And John is very interested in protecting our beliefs around the God-man. What we know for sure, uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones points this out. There were those in the church that said Jesus Christ didn't have a real body. He had a phantom one. So the word was not made flesh. And God didn't suffer on the cross in the flesh. Others were saying, this is very interesting, others were saying, we need to distinguish between the man Jesus and the eternal Christ. And they did this by saying, when Jesus was baptized in the Jordan, the eternal Christ came to dwell in him. And then, right before Jesus suffered on the cross the eternal Christ left the man Jesus. So it wasn't the eternal Christ who suffered on the cross. You can see how very problematic this is. You're probably, even if you've only been around church a little bit, you're kind of like, I don't think that's the story. It's not the story. 
the man Jesus put to death, but by that time, you know, God had left the building. So you can see how this is problematic. Now come right back to this intro with me. Come right with that in mind, hold that in your head, come right back to this intro. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we've seen it and we testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. What's going on here? You can trust the apostolic witness. You can trust what we saw. And what's he saying here? There's no phantom. No phantom. No ghost. I've heard... Well, well, John, people hear all kinds of things. Well, then I've seen. Well, John, people see all kinds of stuff. I touched it. I handled the truth. And I, I don't suggest it to you. I proclaim it to you. John doesn't even bother with a beginning because he's so wound up and doubling down and driving his point home. Notice, I love this. He doesn't just say, I heard. He says, I heard with my ears. <laughs> He's trying to drive it home. I saw with these eyeballs. My eyeballs saw him. I touched with my hands. I handled the truth. Trust me when I say this to you and don't let anyone lead you into anything other than what you've heard from the beginning. Notice the word manifest appears a couple times or made manifest, even better. That statement is clear or obvious to the eye or mind. Apparent, evident, the very opposite is hidden or secret. What is he saying here? To heck with your secret knowledge. To heck with your special revelation. To heck with that. I know what I heard. I know what I saw. I know what I touched. And I know what it means. And this I proclaim to you. What is the witch? The witch that appears over and over again in this text that which is from the beginning? What is the witch? I'll answer just a few questions. What is the witch? Who is the we? And what do the witch and the we have to do with you and me? Those are the questions I set out to answer. Who or what is being described here as the word of life? He begins without a beginning, but he begins by talking about that which was from the beginning. Jesus Christ. If you're, if you're new to church, the, the answer is usually Jesus. Jesus Christ, he's the subject of this section, the eternal Son of God, is slightly veiled with flowery language, but if you know John's gospel or even how the whole Bible starts, you know exactly what's being referred to here. There's an incredible similarities between the beginning of John's letter to the churches, the beginning of God, John's gospel, and the beginning of the story of God in Genesis 1. I'll just read them to you. I just, it's too good. It's too good. Read it again with me. 1 John 1.1, 1, 1. we're going to read one verse further. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest and we have seen it. We testify to it. We proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. 
And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Read on. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you. God is light. There is no darkness in him at all. John's gospel starts like this, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has overcome it. Wow. The very beginning of your Bible, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters, and God said what? Light it up. And there was light. And God saw that that light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. Isn't that cool? Jesus is the eternal, transcendent God who is that which is from the beginning. The eternal has somehow materialized in the carnal, and it means salvation and rescue for those who are in despair. Through Jesus, God is made visible. Through Jesus, God is made audible. Through Jesus, God can be touched. And through Jesus, we are given this divine life, this eternal life. And eternal life, by the way, is not just a reference to quantity of time. It's a reference to quality of time. So it's not just living forever. It is abundant life. And it's found in knowing God. That life, that abundant, forever, eternal life that we long for has come to us in Christ. You can see why John doesn't even bother with an intro. He's he's screaming, we've been liberated from speculation about God, and we've been granted revelation through Christ. We can know what God is like when we look to Christ. Who's the we? One of the questions I got last week was, Trav, if this is the last living apostle, apostle, why plural? Why the we? Who's he referring to? John is saying, I'm not alone in this. He didn't appear to me in my closet. There were other eyewitnesses. I'm not alone in my testimony, and I'm not proclaiming to you something that's unique to me. I'm proclaiming it from a we place. I'm a part of a larger community that hold to this story. The Apostle Paul would do the same thing. He uses the apostolic we, and I'm pretty sure he didn't run it by Peter before he sent it to the church. He's speaking on behalf of these eyewitnesses who were there, saw, heard, and are now leading the church. He's saying what the Apostle Peter would say when he says, We did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We were eyewitnesses to his majesty. You can trust our account. So when John uses we or our or us, he has in mind those who are eyewitnesses to Jesus's ministry, those who had a front row seat, and certainly John had that. In order to prove something, you need what? An eyewitness. I mean, that's usually case closed, right? Actually, what's case closed is two or three. Two or three that saw the same thing seems to seal the deal, make it firmly established. Our governments did not come up with that. It's actually in the Word of God in Deuteronomy 19. Matthew actually references Deuteronomy 19, he's riffing on it when he says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. What John's doing here is he's establishing the trustworthiness of his testimony by saying this is an apostolic we. We. The last question will answer, what does we have to say about which uh, to you? Let me think about what I just said. Okay, 
The answer to this question is found in a little phrase that you'll see over and over again in these first four verses, so that. He's sharing, he's testifying, he's proclaiming things to us today, so that, blank. In verse three, so that you too may have fellowship with us and with God. That's what it has to do with you and me. And then he says, so that our joy may be complete. So the first thing he says is, I'm writing so that we can have a sort of fellowship, a connection, so that you can join us. So you, he's saying, join the we. This is not a royal we, an exclusive we. I want you to join us in our message, and that'll make my joy complete. John's sharing so that he can invite us into this. I love how he throws this in. And he's like, and if you join us, if you join us, just to let you know, you're joining God the Father and God the Son. Just throwing that in there. I'm not just saying join me and join we. I'm saying you join this testimony, you join God the Father, and you join God the Son. What an invitation he's extending. I want this fellowship, not just an apostolic we, but a Trinitarian we. That's what we're being invited into. And he says, or actually, just to, just to throw this out, because I think it's important, you and me join the we when we trust apostolic witness and testimony. You and me join the we when we align ourselves with the testimony of the New Testament. You and me align ourselves by holding to the New Testament, which is God's authorized testimony and witness, and faithfully participating in a local church that sits under apostolic teaching. We join the we. Verse 4, so that, he says, that, now here's his pastoral concern. When you get it right and you agree with me, what we have is a sort of shared joy. Joy filled full, so that our joy may be complete. What's better than joy? Shared joy. That you can look to the right and to the left and be like, did you see that? Did you? Are you, are you experiencing what I'm experiencing? The connection of being caught up in something together. And that's what he's wanting. And that's what he has. He's like, and I think you mamas, like, you know this well. Like, you're not happy until everybody's happy. And so consequently, you're not ever happy, you know? But, but there's that, like, if I can't share this, I don't even want this. Like, I, I want other people to get this. And this is, this is, he doesn't even start with an intro because I think he's so longing to share this. When my daughters really want to share something with me, it's like, they don't start with like, Father, I would like to book a time with you to share. No, what I'm interested in, no, it's just you launch because you can't contain yourself. I was asking the question this week of like, what are you actually experiencing when you're experiencing joy? What is joy? How would you define it in a sentence or a phrase? It's really difficult to do, and I think it's difficult to do because I think joy is actually a byproduct of something else. I think it's produced. I think it's the result of various factors kind of playing upon your soul. Martin Lloyd-Jones says that when you experience joy, what you're actually experiencing or what's coming up and out is complete satisfaction. You've pushed away from the table and there was nothing about that meal that could or should have been different. It's a complete and total satisfaction that you're experiencing when you experience joy. So if you're dissatisfied, you're not experiencing joy. We know that. Full satisfaction is what you're feeling when you feel joy. That's why for those of us who are more critical, it's really hard to get there, isn't it? Because we're always spotting what's missing and we wish we could be Odie, but we're more Garfield, you know? Okay, 
The second thing is exaltation. Basically, Martin Lloyd-Jones makes the point that joy is active and it actually must be expressed. It's a positive spirit, a sort of brightness of spirit. So he makes a distinction between happiness and joy and he essentially says, a child can be playing with a toy and perfectly happy, just content, happy. But when you walk by that child and say, hey, I bought you something and you pull out of your pocket another toy, what you're gonna see is a sort of brightness and joy that's active. It's a sort of like, I'm rejoicing in this moment. And lastly, Martin Lloyd-Jones says that when you're experiencing joy, what you're experiencing is power and strength. This is probably the best thing I read this week, so share my joy with me right now. If you're done, just get up for one last quote. Worship team, would you guys come? I suggest to you that in joy, there is always a feeling of power and of strength. That is why I was at pains to ridicule the false notions of joy. There's never anything flabby or superficial about it. Joy is one of the strongest powers in the world. Someone who's in a state of joy is, in a sense, afraid of nothing. When you're truly joyful, You're wound up by some mighty dynamic power. You feel strong. You're lifted above yourself. You're ready to meet every enemy from every direction and quarter. You smile in the face of them all and you say, I defy them. They can never rob me of it. The joy of the Lord is your strength. It's a strong power and it's a mighty and robust thing. The first followers of Jesus had this. And because they had this, we're here today. They didn't share this out of duty. They shared this out of joy. They shared this because they were deeply satisfied with the work of Christ and what they saw. They shared this because they couldn't help but exult. They couldn't help but rejoice in what God had done through Christ. And they shared this because that joy was power and strength. And they defied everything that looked to rob it from them. Would you stand with me? What a joy to invite us into communion right now. We're going to rejoice in what God has done through Christ. I'm really asking God that he would fill us with power and strength this morning. Jesus told his first followers, John would have been there, to break bread and remember my body broken for you, to take the cup and remember my blood shed for you, remember what I've done. And we're still taking and participating in this meal to this day. And so as you come, please remember the we that we're a part of. And I'm asking that God would give us, He would grant us a shared joy together. Some of that satisfaction, oh, to be satisfied. Jesus, you're enough. What you've done is enough. God has done something in Christ that has changed everything. The eternal, transcendent God has come near and everything has changed as a result. He will make all things new and we're just the beginning of that. May you, as you take and eat, have a deep satisfaction in Christ. May you rejoice. May you exult. May there be a brightness and a positivity as you think about what He's done. And may the joy of the Lord strengthen you in a deep way. Let's lift him up with a loud voice and receive the table. If you trust in Christ, come take the elements.
Thanks for listening. We want to be a resource for you as you walk with Jesus. So please connect with us at radiantbicelia.com. Until next time. There is a heavenly city that I'm compelled to find. Oh, I love the flowers and trees and the smell of the grinding sea and all the beautiful things here in life. I